What a pleasant way to start the day, isn't it? Meditation in our Sangha. We're very fortunate. I consider myself very fortunate to be a part of your Sangha and what's developed here. It's never lost on me how, uh, as the Buddha pointed out in the Anapanasati Sutta, how rare this is in the world. Um, I, this is the second talk this week on the uh, on Sariputta and Moggallana. I won't read the the whole uh, narrative um, because I did a Tuesday, but like a synopsis. I'll give you a synopsis. Um, Upatisa and Kalita, um, who would become Sariputta and Moggallana respectively, uh, were born on the same day um, in neighboring town. <clears throat> And their names were derived from uh, the fact that their both of their families were prominent, and so their their names were given as was customary at the time, reflective of the town. So Upatisa was born in Upatisa, Kalita, in Kalita. They were both men of uh, high intellect um, and great curiosity about the world around them. And so by the time in their mid-teens, um, they had developed their own type of following, not, not that they were spiritual teachers, um, but they they gathered followers based on their, their pursuits and what they were doing. Um, again, they were men of high intellect, but they were also, um, uh, they also developed themselves recreationally. They were athletes, et cetera, much like, much like Siddhartha uh, was. Uh, they, they, didn't, they weren't aware of Siddhartha at the time, but they, they would be, uh, and that's later in the narrative. Um, like Siddhartha, um, they became um, disappointed with this constant pursuit of sensory indulgence and gaining more fame and having more followers. And much like Siddhartha, they noticed the competitiveness around them, the aggressiveness, the need to acquire things. Um, and they're, they're also becoming aware of the fleeting nature of life. And um, and they kind of came to the same conclusion that there, that if life is so fleeting and experiences are so fleeting, what's the point of all this? And so they decided, again, much like Siddhartha, to leave all that behind, leave the home life and enter the homeless life, meaning they started wandering around northern India. Um, remember, they were contemporaries of Siddhartha, so they likely studied with some of the same teachers that he did, uh, although there's no mention that they actually studied with Alara Kalama or Radeka Ramaputta. It's, it's a really good bet that they did and other spiritual teachers. And that led them to the same conclusion that Siddhartha came to, that those teachings were lacking in developing understanding. Uh, they became particularly fond of uh, one teacher, a uh, prominent teacher of the time named Sanjaya. Uh, but they never completely uh, engaged in, in Sanjaya's uh, doctrine. And after a number of years, probably around four or five years, maybe six years, um, they decided that they were both going to return back to the region of their birth, um, kind of disappointed that they didn't find out what they offered. So they, they both went back to Rajagaha, um, and they told each other that if they found what they were looking for, they would find the, find the other one and tell them of their discovery. A short while, and in the meantime, uh, Siddhartha Gautama had uh, developed awakening. He became a Buddha. And this is shortly, shortly after, probably within four or five or six months of the Buddha's awakening. So the, the timing is interesting, and that relates to something later in the narrative. So Upatis is walking down the road one day, and he sees uh, Ajayi, who was, Ajayi was one of the five friends that the Buddha wandered with around uh, northern India. So remember the story of the, of the Dhammachaka Pavatana Sutta, where one of those uh, friends, Kandana, understood he awakened on the spot and declared that all conditioned things that arise are subject to cessation. Ajaya was one of the other ones. Um, and so if you remember the on retreat, we, we went through the first three suttas. And in that period of time, all those followers awakened. So Ajaya had now understood the Dhamma and he's been practicing it for a few months. Upatisa comes across Ajaya on the, on the road one day and, and notices this calm demeanor. Um, and he recognizes this man has something that he'd like to know. And Ajay was on his arms rounds, not like Bahia, 
he let Ajay finish his arms around and begin to relax. And then he approached him and he said, I noticed, you know, I noticed you. Who, who is your teacher? And Ajay said, my teacher is, is uh, an awakened one, the Buddha. And so let me, I'll get back to the nar nar narrative here. So I'm calling him Ajay. It's Asaji. I'm sorry. <clears throat> so he, he asked Asaji to tell him uh, who his teacher is. And Asaji told him of the Buddha, a rightly self-awakened one. Upatisa asks, what does the teacher teach? What does he proclaim? And Asaji told Upatisa that he has only been a disciple of the Tathagata for a short while, but will explain his teachings as succinctly as he could. So he says, all things arise from a cause that causes ignorance. And the path developing cessation of ignorance is an eightfold path. This is my teacher's doctrine. Upon hearing those words, Upatisa's mind began to clear and he realized that there was something here. Um, that there was a means for his own understanding. He asked Asaji where he could find this great teacher, and Asaji told him that he was nearby in the Bamboo Grove Monastery. The reason why the Buddha um, was in Rajagaha is, a, is during his seeking understanding, he came across King Bimbisara. King Bimbisara was so taken by this young Siddhartha that he asked him to promise to come back to him and teach him what he had found once he developed understanding. So, uh, Siddhartha, now the Buddha, remembered that promise, and so he made it back to Rajagaha. And he taught King Bimbisara the Dhamma. King Bimbisara was so taken by what he had learned that he donated the what would become the Bamboo Grove Monastery. So the, the Buddha now had an established place to spend uh, and, to, and to develop a Sangha in that area. He had a center. Upatisa, thinking of his friend Kalita, told Asaji to go ahead and he would find his friend and they would both see him soon. Upon finding Kalita, he told him of his discovery. By his appearance, Kalita could sense that his friend had discovered something, something remarkable. Upatisa described what he had found and they agreed to find the Buddha. Out of respect to one of their teachers, Sanjaya, they decided to, to go and tell him what they had found. Uh, and they were hoping that they could convince him to follow him. So coming upon Sanjaya, they told him that an awakened one, a Buddha, had appeared in the world. They said that his doctrine is well received by many and that he had a large group of monks following his path. They hoped that Sanjaya would realize their sincerity and join them in traveling to the Buddha. Sanjaya declined and offered Upatisa and, Ko and Kalita senior positions in his Sangha if they would stay and teach as one of his disciples. Upatisa and Kalita declined. Uh, and then they asked Sanjaya directly to come with them. Sanjaya told them that they could go, but he could not. They asked Sanjaya why he could not join them. And Sanjaya told them, I have a large following, teaching many. I cannot now become the student of another. A little bit of self-referential arrogance there, isn't it? Uh, and that's an important part of the story. Upatisa and Kalita pleaded with Sanjaya, a Buddha has appeared in the world. Large crowds flock to him. We are going as well. What will become of you? They had a sincere concern about Sanjaya. Sanjaya said, what do you think? Are there more fools or wise people in the world? And Upatisa and Kalita said, well, there's more fools than wise people. The fools are many, the wise are few. Sanjaya replied, that being so, the wise will go to the recluse Gautama, and the fools will come to me, a fool like them. So what Sanjaya understands here is that a large number of followers does not determine the usefulness and effectiveness of any particular dharma. Sanjaya is content to merely have followers, no matter how foolish they are, or he is, or his teachings prove to be. Sanjaya knows that fools who wish to continue foolish dharmas will continue to follow him. Those seeking wisdom and understanding will find a dharma teacher grounded in the wisdom of an authentic dharma. And I go on a little bit more there. But the, the point of that is even... What, what a, a critical point in Upatisa's and Kalita's life, because they could have easily taken on that, um, that misguided understanding that numbers, the number of people doing something proves that it proves its effectiveness. It's obviously, it's much more than that. And, and to have immediate fame, that they would be held up as one of these great teachers of Sanjaya's doctrine. They weren't interested in any of that. They, weren't, they were interested in, in learning the truth about human life. So they left. Um, a short while later, there was a split among Sanjaya's pupils and about half of his 500 followers 
also left to find the awakened one. And then half of those went back too. So not everyone was taken by the Buddha. Um, those, again, just like Sanjaya predicted, those that are seeking wisdom will find a wise teacher and a wise Dhamma. Those that want to continue their foolish ways will find someone that will continue that. It just makes sense, doesn't it? Just logical sense that we're naturally joined, drawn to or will associate people that will continue to reaffirm the views that we're holding about ourselves in relation to the world, <laughs> unless we're willing to face that maybe the views that we're holding are wrong views. And that's where the Buddha's Dhamma begins, isn't it? From recognizing and accepting wrong views. When these two wanderers arrived at the Bamboo Grove Monastery, they found the Buddha teaching the Dharma to a large group. The Buddha noticed their arrival and addressed those gathered. These two wanderers, Upatisa and Kalita, will one day be my, chief, my two chief disciples. So some people say, because of things like this reference, that the Buddha had, had clairvoyance and prescience and a bunch of other uh, supernatural powers. The Buddha just simply could read people because he was so present and he understood human nature. And he could see by the desire that these two fellows had and their, their clarity of thought even before they came to the Dhamma, that it was obvious that they would become two of his chief disciples. And that, that proved to be true. Um, there, and there's much made in the narrative, and I talked a little bit more about this Tuesday that I'm going to today. But in the narrative um, that I took, my narrative out, mostly from Nyana Panika Terra's writings, but a few other ones. Um, Chris Humph Humphreys was another one. Um, they, they go into quite a bit of detail about the, and the, all the principal actors, the Buddha, Upatisa, Kalita, and other ones, how they interacted with each other throughout the ages in past lives. And this one did, was this in that life, and this one was that, and one was the brother and the mother and, and all this. Um, and the foundation for most most of that that reference is some is found in the Jataka Fables or the Jataka Tales, which is a book that's included in the Kadeka uh, Nikaya, a fifth book of the of the Pali Canon. The, that that book, um, most scholars will agree, was added. It was developed during the time of the different councils, but it was an accessory book that included subjects that didn't quite fit into the other four books. And then the Jataka tales were added probably uh, a couple or 300 years later um, to kind of um, qualify now references to past life and make that much more important and emphasize past lives uh, much more than the Buddha ever intended. Eva, did you have a question? Were the suttas in uh, some sort of sequential or they're just kind of random? Yeah, they, well, they're random. The, um, the reason why they're grouped is very interesting. But to answer your question, no, they're, they're, it, they're not chronological. In other words, it doesn't yeah, go from the Buddha's like first. Growing, no. You, you know, uh, deepening as of the Buddha as he's telling his suttas or as they're being told of him. You know, we don't get to see like. No, that's why you got to come listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the, the, it, the, the way that they're grouped in the different books is really remarkable. And, and because the different books relate to different subjects and different aspects of the Buddhist teaching, um, the, the Diga Nikaya is an example of, of mostly versed and short teachings. The Sutta, um, the, the Majima Nikaya is uh, middle length discourses. In other words, if you remember that the Buddha gave a, a a kind of a middle talk, a middle length talk, you know where to find it. Uh, another section is broken down by numbers, subjects. In other words, uh, one subject would relate to a series of talks. The Four Noble Truths, if you wanted to learn what did the Buddha say about something, I think it was Four Noble Truths, you look in the Book of Fours. If you want to learn about the Eightfold Path, you look in the Book of Eights. If you want to know the Seven fact Factors of Awakening, you look in the Book of Sevens. So when you think, remember that the... Um, the suttas were first preserved orally for the first few hundred years. And the way that that was preserved was that groups of, of advanced monks and nuns, eventually nuns, um, were given sections of the Buddhist teachings that they would remember and they would repeat over and over again 
which is really the foundation of Buddhist chant. And so they needed to group them that way rather than chronologically. It wouldn't have made any sense. And then again, the, the Kudaka Rum Nikaya was teachings that didn't fit in those other books. That doesn't mean that they're irrelevant or secondary. They just didn't, they couldn't categorize them anyway. And they're mostly very short teachings. So thank you for the question. Um, so, and, and then getting back into the, 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 the past lives, um, the Buddha would, an overemphasis on past lives was part of the spiritual lexicon of, of the day, uh, rooted in the Vedas and later the Upanishads, which would become today's modern Hinduism. Um, and so the Buddha would reference past lives, much like he would reference karma, because it was a common term, but he referenced them in completely um, contradictory and almost antagonistic ways to the way they were commonly applied. So the Buddha would mention past lives simply because it was what people thought about and thought about them as important. And even in some of the um, some of the suttas, especially the in, in modern sutras too, the, 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 what Mahayana Buddhism is based on, will declare that an awakened human being will have these certain powers. And one of the powers is complete knowledge of past lives. The Buddha never said that. In fact, when you read through the suttas, he'll 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 talk about certain people that have developed these psychic powers, if you will, but also make the point that just because they have these psychic powers, they're lacking in the Dhamma. And, and they're not someone that, that just because of those powers means that they have, they've really learned anything. There's many spiritual teachers around today, and I won't, I won't mention any by name, who teach that way. They, they, they show certain magical powers. Um, one that's still famous today is he'll have fire appear in his palms of his hands. Well, it's just a magic trick. But it wows people that they, they think that they're forming miracles when the underlying dharma really has no foundation. That's, so it's truly dogma. We talked about that. So the Buddha would mention past lives, but then he would, he would teach the irrelevance of even understanding that. And those were, when we went through the series of those four... Um, the four teachings of how the Buddha taught and why he didn't teach certain things. Remember to uh, Vajagoda, Anuruddha, Malakaputta, and then the, uh, the Kula Sakaka Sutta. Um, he would say that those questions such as, where was I? Who was I in the past? Who am I going to be in the future? He, and he said, those are, those are foolish. Those are distracting. Don't even consider that. They do not relate to the Dhamma. Well, that's what those questions are about, isn't it? Who was I in a past life? Who might I be in a future life? The reason why the Buddha says that those are irrelevant, he doesn't say that it, that it hasn't occurred, but as far as developing the Dhamma, you need to have your mind united in your body. And the only way that can occur is if you're mindful of what's occurring right now and not distracted about who you were and who you might be. So the, the, the importance of past lives um, is almost entirely discounted by the Buddha within the framework of his Dhamma. So that's why I don't go into a lot of it in this in this narrative, I guess I just do. It has to. It has to be said, though, we, it, we, because we can get so caught up in that, can't we? I mean, that's that's truly magical thinking. Of if I, and it, and it usually goes along this way. If I follow certain guidelines, I'm going to get rewarded. Well, the, that's a that's a huge distraction, and isn't it that I've been such a good person today? All I've got to do is hang on a little bit longer, and I'm going to get my pot of gold. A, a complete removal doing it yourself from what's occurring your mind is now out of your body and you're focused on the pot of gold rather than simply understanding what's occurring just go to why the 250 people went back yes they're asking the wrong question that exactly they're asking a wrong question and they demanded an answer of that foolish question of that question rooted in ignorance of four noble truths and how do we how do we ask i mean that's one of the reasons why i ask you for questions because that's how I know that the Sangha is developing. It, and that's how the Buddha knew, by their questions that was asked. If, and sometimes he would, he would answer a question, a direct question, by sitting silent. And that was simply to show that the question has no basis in what we're teaching here. And sometimes he would use the words, you foolish person, but in a very kind and gentle way, but to get immediately to the point. Okay, let me get back to the narrative. So Upatisa and Kalita approached the Buddha, bowed and sat to one side. They requested the going forth, and this is so important too, um, about ordination within the original Sangha and how that, that kind of changed. I took an ordination in a, uh, 
the, the Kagyu lineage of Tibetan Buddhism. And it was a very elaborate, not, not ordination as a full monk, initial ordination. Uh, I guess you could call it a novice, but it's even before that. But anyway, I took my vows. And, it, and even that was a very elaborate three-day ceremony um, that was, it was marvelous to be a part of. It was also very distracting because I remember the whole time thinking that come Sunday afternoon, I'm going to be really exalted. <laughs> <laughs> of course, after I got my, and I, I'm not, uh, it was a beautiful ceremony. And my teacher, who I, most people would call a root guru, he's just my teacher. Um, it was a marvelous ceremony, put the white shawl on, we touched heads. Um, but again, I was the same person after we banged heads as I was <laughs> after. Um, it, and it was, and they weren't making any, it was my anticipation. They didn't say anything that, you know, in fact, the implication was that once you did this, now you have some real serious training, which I never did. But you know that that's how easily we get caught up in it. That if I just do some simple task that has nothing related to developing understanding of the three marks of existence, I'm going to be some magically exalted human being. And I was for a few a few weeks. Then my feet landed on the ground. I realized I needed to do something different. So anyway, so uh, Upatisa and Kalita requested the going forth, meaning entry into the sangha and training in the Dhamma. The Buddha accepted them immediately and reinforced the effectiveness and purpose of the Dhamma. He said these words, join us, Bhikkhu, live the pure life to end suffering. So he laid the whole foundation of why anybody would want to join the Dhamma, join the Buddha and his Dhamma, to live the pure life and end suffering. And it, it, never, it never gets more complicated than that, except as we start confronting our own uh, conditioned thinking. <laughs> So again, my commentary on that, avoiding dramatic or ritualistic, magical or mystical initiations or empowerments, the Buddha ordained Upatisa and Kalita. Their sincere desire and presence established their commitment to the Buddha, his Dhamma, and the Sangha. And that's, a, that's an acknowledgement of right intention, holding the intention to recognize and abandon, craving for and clinging to wrong views, rooted in ignorance of four noble truths. Upon ordination, Upatisa is given the name Saraputta. Excuse me. And Kaluta, Kalita is given the name Mogalana. Mogalana left for a nearby town and developed wisdom, virtue, and concentration, the three elements of the Eightfold Path. In short order, he attained the goal and his mind cleared. Saraputta stayed with the Buddha. A few weeks later, the Buddha was giving a discourse to Saraputta's nephew, uh, Diganaka. The Buddha is expounding on the impermanence of feelings and thoughts, the arising and passing away. Saraputta listened with mindfulness rooted in concentration. Upon hearing the Buddha's words to his nephew, Saraputta's mind cleared and he attained arahantship. Um, in, in the narrative, this is where uh, the narratives get into the past lives. I just explained that, how they're rooted in the Jataka ta tales or the Jataka fables. Um, I'm sorry. So now the uh, Saraputta and Mogalana are developing the Dhamma. They're, they're being of service um, to the Sangha by teaching and also by um, holding the presence of the Dhamma while the Buddha is doing off on other business. And both Saraputta and Mogalana were able to be examples to novices as well as established monks and nuns, and they continue today. They assisted in the administration of the Sangha as well as teaching when the Buddha was absent from the Sangha. They achieved greatness not because they were able to, of what they were able to acquire, they lived simple and austere lives. And Saraputta and Moggallana continued to provide ins inspiration towards developing authentic and meaningful lives, leading to awakening to all aspirants. The example of their, their determination to awaken and their complete willingness to recognize the three marks of existence and abandon wrong views rooted in ignorance of four noble truths. And that's kind of what the, the Jataka tales are useful for if you don't get caught up and, and try to make them any type of reality, even if they might be real. In, in other words, trying to bring the past into the present, that just doesn't make sense. Um, but what the tales convey is the, um, the ongoing right intention and right effort that it must be present in all of us if we're going to awaken. We actually have to take to the Dhamma wholeheartedly. Just as they, that's the example that they live. And that's, and that's the example that's 
really developed in the Jataka tales. A lot of them have have the Buddha and other actors as animals and and using using ex exaggeration of animal behavior to make a point of the of the determination and the compassion necessary for awakening. Oh, and again, I won't get into into that any further. So the next, these are two short suttas that um, that both of these actors are um, reflected in, and there's many suttas uh, that uh, Saraputta and Moggallana are central to. Either they're they're the subject of it, or they're actually given the teaching. This sutta is is called the Upatisa Sutta about Upatisa, and it just describes how he has developed. Uh, in such a pure and, um, and well-focused way. A monk well-established in the heartwood of the, heartwood of the Dhamma is the Eightfold Path. A monk well-established in the heartwood of the Dhamma, Venerable Saraputta, addressed those gathered. Friends, as I withdrew from seclusion, I had these thoughts. Knowing impermanence, when change occurs in the world, would sorrow, regret, pain, distress, and despair arise within me, like exactly how the Buddha described suffering. Then I had these thoughts, knowing impermanence, when change occurs in the world, sorrow, regret, pain, distress, and despair would not arise within me. And this is an, this is an important teaching, simply recognizing the different quality of mind that he has developed within the Dhamma, that he's seeing things differently. He's seeing he's gone from wrong view to right view, simply by understanding the impermanent nature of all things understanding one of the three marks of existence. But of course, in understanding that, he's understanding that second mark, anatta, wrong views of self. And so there's no resulting suffering. So in that one statement, the Saraput is describing gaining great insight into the three marks of existence, impermanence, the not self characteristic and suffering. Venerable Ananda, who was present, said to Venerable Saraputta, Saraputta, my friend, what if there were change in, in our teacher, in the Tathagata, would sorrow, regret, pain, distress, and despair arise within you? And so changing this word is what would happen, what will happen when the Buddha dies or if he dies. Saraputta replied, even if there were change in our teacher, in the Tathagata, sorrow, regret, pain, distress, and despair would not arise within me. My mind would remain at peace, in, in parentheses, from understanding impermanence and having released all self-referential views rooted in ignorance. I would then think if our teacher, if the Tathagata were to remain in the world, it would be for the welfare, benefit, and happiness of all beings. I would then think a being of great purpose, of great accomplishment, of great powers has disappeared. Simply, he, what he's stating is he's simply stating the obvious and seeing the obvious. It would have been wonderful for the Buddha to be able to continue his teaching career, but now he can't. And so a great being has left, period. No regret, no sorrow. Much like Ananda, Ananda would, would have later in, uh, in the Maha Paranabhana Sutta when he heard that the Buddha told him, I'm not long for this world, I'm dying. And Ananda didn't, was not able to main, maintain a level of mindfulness and reacted to that. What's going to become of us? Who's going to be our teacher? And the Buddha said, I'm, I'm not like a teacher with a closed fist. I've held nothing back. I've given you everything you need. Be an, in the, the, that famous line, be an island unto yourself. Strive diligently for your own awakening. And Ananda would finally get it. Venerable Nanda himself, understanding the three marks of existence, declared, Venerable Saraputta's eye-making and mind-making and obsessions with conceit have long been uprooted. Even if change occurs to our teacher, to the Tathagata, no sorrow, <clears throat> regret, pain, distress, or despair would arise within him. Well, again, that, that sutta about Upatisa, about Saraputta, is describing an awakened human being in very simple and direct terms. And in such simple and direct terms that, it, that there's no doubt that we as fellow human beings can achieve that. All that we need to do is find out what Saraputta did to do it and follow that, the Eightfold Path, the Heartwood. The next sutta is, is to Magalana. Uh, the Buddha was in Savati at Jita's Grove, Anatha Pandika's monastery. Venerable Maha Magalana, was sitting nearby. Maha means now he has he is recognized for his awakened state. The Venerable Maha Magalana was sitting nearby, established in mindfulness, well concentrated, his mind united with his body. The Buddha recognized a profound concentration supporting the refined mindfulness of Mokalana and declared, 
with mindfulness immersed and well established in the body, restrained with regard to the sixth sense base, well concentrated, this one can know unbinding for himself. That's the end of the sutta. Again, just a simple observation of an awakened human being and, and now just using them as an example of just their presence. The Buddha described an awakened human being, the quality of their mind as calm and as unbound or released from clinging to wrong views. And that's the perfect description. There's nothing left to disturb that quality of mind, is there, in Moggallana or, or uh, Saraputta. Their minds are at peace, much like we are. Thank you for listening to that. Uh, so any, any questions about, the, about this uh, interesting story? Do you find it interesting? Because <laughs> there are going to be more. There, there's, I've been wanting to do uh, uh, a series of talks on um, some of the accomplished monks and nuns for a while now. And, and occasionally I'll be doing that. I won't do it in a series. But uh, I think they're, they're important. They're very interesting. And they, they make the point that these are just human beings that were lucky enough to encounter the Buddha. But most importantly, were lucky enough to encounter his Dhamma. And through his Dhamma, they were able to achieve the goal, which is developing a calm and peaceful mind. Lorna, good morning. Good to see you this morning. Good to see you and see everybody. Good morning. Very good. Um, no, I was getting nervous about these. What, what uh, <laughs> struck me when I read this is when his friend is describing the Dhamma, um, and it says that all things arise from a cause. Uh, you could say all stress or all dukkha arise from a cause, I guess. But well, that's the subject, yes. Yeah, uh, the cause is ignorance. Yeah. I think that's so direct that you, in your mind, you just can't read around it. All, all dukkha arises from a cause. Yeah. The cause is ignorance. Yeah. And the Four Noble Truths. It's so direct. It, it kind of like catches your breath almost. Yeah. That's how I read it anyway. That's the right way to read it. And then he, he went on to say, obviously, that the cessation of the eightfold path to explain more. Um, and then, something happened yesterday. I was talking to someone, and I had a conversation, and then the script. And you know, as we do, we don't leave the conversation, we keep on thinking about the conversation <laughs> and what we should have said, you know. If I'd have said that, I'd have seen brighter, I'd have seen like I knew what I was doing more or whatever. You know, you keep keep that story rolling on. And I, I which I did, and then I caught myself again, come back to you, you know, this is not me, this is not mine, this is not who I am which I have done in the past, but this time, when I comprehended what was happening, I felt very sad. Mm. It, just a sadness came over me. And I have thought about that, that saying, in that sort of situation, appropriate situation, said that to me, but not had a reaction to it, you know, just like, mm. what's wrong with it? That's what I'm supposed to think, so I'm thinking about it. Um, but as I say, I, I didn't, as I comprehended what I was doing, following on the story, etc., cetera, um, which is what you've just put into the um, meditation, you know, the start of the meditation, yep. how you describe it. But, um, I didn't. As I say, I felt very sad. I, I didn't go to a sort of like a neutral. I went below that. And I felt very sad when I realized I had to abandon, I should abandon these thoughts, which I was carrying on, which is my anatta, which was making me happy. You know, like you do that <coughs> to, to build, boost your ego, whatever you like, when you have this other secondary conversation, if you will. You're kind of like boosting your own ego and yeah. all the conversations you should have said would have made me, me look good, you know, and all that sort of stuff. So you kind of boosting your ego. And when I sort of comp really comprehended what I was just doing, 
that I was saying to myself about that. And it wasn't a sadness. Well, you know, on a warm, sunny day, and quite a dark, the sun will go behind quite a dark cloud, and there's kind of like a shift in the atmosphere. It, it comes cooler and a little darker, really quite suddenly, sometimes. And although the change is kind of sudden, it's also soft. Mm -hmm. This feeling that I had, it was like that, but it, it was a change, but it, it's the sadness, but it, in a soft way. Um, I think that's all I have to say. <laughs> that's a lot. Thank you. Uh, there, there's there's two components of what you're talking about. Um, it, it often to um, to translate something from the Pali to the English, we have to use words that aren't entirely appropriate. Uh, but the Buddha would talk about skillful shame, um, which is simply a sadness of of when we start looking at our our behavior and the consequences of that, and that is skillful to, to have that. And so often we can, that's one of the reasons why I always say we have to be gentle with ourselves. Well, we might feel a sadness over our own behavior and wish that we had done something better. But of course, there's the framework of the Eightfold Path to, to guide us along that way. The other thing you reminded me of, um, when I was in my second rehab, the first one didn't take one, <laughs> the implication, uh, back in 1981, they had this little ritual, and I'm sure they still do this thing, in many rehabs that then um, it's usually done you have a big like a, pl a, a blow up bottle like I think I think the one that they were using then was Chivas Regal maybe no I, they wouldn't have that it was probably Canadian club or something <laughs> but the ritual was that you that you act out saying goodbye to this great friend and it really is 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 representative a good metaphor for that because if you're an alcoholic or a drug addict, that becomes your best friend. In this way, our feelings and our emotions, because they're so familiar to us, that when we start letting go of them, it feels like we're losing a great friend. And so there can be a sadness there too, just in that, in that separation from who we are becoming and what we used to be. And that's to be acknowledged. And how do we acknowledge it? We stay present with it. Just like you said, come back and recognize the calm bodily fabrications. And that's the way to move through it. If we resist it, we're going to do what Sanjaya's followers did and leave the Dhamma and go back to something that, that allows us to be comfortable in our own ignorance. And then you started out by saying that line, it really does get right to the point. But for people that, that want to continue their own ignorance, they'll usually take that as, well, that doesn't really apply to me. And they might even continue with Dhamma practice, but losing that initial foundation that I'm, I'm addressing my own ignorance of Four Noble Truths. Or it will be so direct and upsetting that they'll say, well, this isn't for me. This is just too negative. And they'll leave it that way. So it needs to be put in perspective, but it gets right to the point, isn't it? doesn't it? And that's what the Buddha awakened to. He awakened to that it's ignorance of Four Noble Truths, that all manner of suffering arises. So if we're going to be Dhamma practitioners, at least Dhamma practitioners that follow the Buddha's Dhamma, that's the central issue that we have to face. And you, you expressed it beautifully well. Thank you. Okay. David, good to see you this morning. Good morning uh, first of all, I encourage everyone to get that book. The Great Disciples. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, I'll put it on the website. It's not really deep good. with examples. There would be the first one where his humility, he's the chief disciple, but yet he can sweep the ground. Mm -hmm. Or a young novice monks can walk up to him and say, Your robe's not quite right. And he says, Thank you, teacher, to the young monk. Yeah. And it just shows that the aggregates are there but they're not personal yeah he, gets, he basically gets at some point gets mugged from behind and doesn't get angry he doesn't get spiteful he forgives the person trying to goad him into a reaction 
So all these good examples, and just throughout the whole book, it is good examples of how to conduct yourself, or at least see that as an example. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for bringing it up. It, it, the book is called Great Disciples of the Buddha. Um, I think the, the <clears throat> author is listed as Bhikkhu Bodhi, but it might list Bhikkhu Bodhi and Nyanaponika Thera. Um, but I, I'll put it on the website, too. I mean, even the, the past life stuff is entertaining. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> they, they just go is through it? the eons of earth. They were a snake, and the Buddha was a dog, and yeah. you know, the cousin was the evil. Yeah. And just, you, know, you can kind of see how they build up to the, the point of the whole thing. Oh, yeah, it, it shows the, the, the determination through lifetimes, even as animals, that it, that it takes. And if you remember that the that belief that we that we can come back as animals is, was so prevalent at during that time, and it's still prevalent in parts of Indian parts of the world, that we, we can and do become reincarnated, if you will, as animals. So, again, it's just playing into that, that belief. But the important thing is not what we're going to be in a future life is what we are right now. Thank you, David. Hello, Mary. Good to see you. Good to be here. Good to see you. Um, wonderful sutra. Um, you Glad you're here. Good morning, Anthony. How are you? Good morning. I don't have a, a lot to say today. I'm glad that you uh, are incorporating bodily fabrications. Because I get the bodily fabrications as much as the mental fabrications, so it's good to see that acknowledged. Yeah. Um, I just feel very happy to be here and uh, be like honored um, level of insight, and teachings, and this point is just uh, amazing. You know, kind of yeah. anything I say, I think we're kind of room the way I feel. So. <laughs> 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 Thank you, Anthony. <laughs> Good morning, Jen. Um, the, one of the very last things that you said, um, for just his teaching um, about his, his like very few words about impermanence and how he saw recognized impermanent got his insight into the um, and you held that example up against Ananda getting upset about the Buddha leaving, and the Buddha said, <laughs> um, I've held nothing back. He's, I finally like heard that as he's saying, you already know everything you need to know. So just get to work. Yeah. And that's like, that's nice. <laughs> you know, oh yeah, I already know everything. I just have to get to work. And um, so, so that was good. Um, and what Lorna said kind of struck me too, because uh, I've been doing a lot of um, this past week, seeing how I, um, or letting go of my tendency to review conversations or to uh, project myself into the future and have the conversation, um, prepare what I'm going to say and all of that stuff, like watching myself do that um, and recognize it, seeing it totally as anatta and just dropping it. Um, has been really helpful, and um, I didn't realize it until I had a conversation with one of my girlfriends uh, yesterday, and um, I was I was just telling her about my past week and some of the stress that I was dealing with, and she asked me directly. She said, "Well, you know, what started the argument? What did, what, what was happening that that got you upset?" And I. <laughs> and it was fantastic. <laughs> I was like, I don't know. Isn't that great? <laughs> I completely let it go. Like, I have no idea. Because I just know that I've got, you know, I was just reacting and I knew that, you know. And, and I mean, if I could 
just, I mean, mom can attest. Like, I, if, if I would have an argument with somebody or like a disagreement or something, I could tell you everything I said play by play. I could give you a play by play. He said this, and I said this, and then she said this, and then I said this, and then he said this, and then this happened next. And then I said, can you believe what they said? It would just be that. It was a very good description. I don't know any of the words. I don't even know the context. Nothing. Thank you. Congratulations on letting go of all wrong views. <laughs> There's so much freedom there, isn't it? And, and spaciousness. That's true spaciousness. You don't got all this stuff. Uh, <laughs> thank you for that. When you started out talking about the Buddha's quote, isn't it remarkable that 2,600 years later, these words still have such impact on us and they bring such clarity, just something like that. Yeah. Uh, and think about where, what we've, what we're doing here. We're becoming familiar with, with becoming friends with the, with the original Sangha, aren't we? We know about Vacha Goda and Anuruddha and Malankya Puta. We know about Saraputta and Moggallana now. You know, they're, they're part of our Sangha. They're part of our, our Dhamma in a real, you know, meaningful way and the buddha's words are still here you know they 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 continue to inspire after all these years it's really remarkable thank you becky good to see you this morning i'm so happy to be here me too uh, again. <laughs> <laughs> um i really don't have a lot to say today i i found the retreat um was really wonderful and when I came back from the retreat, I was able to bring the Dhamma into my daily life a little bit more than I had before. So I was able to recognize when I was experiencing Dukkha or when Anatta was I need you to say, this is not me, this is not mine. Yeah. Um, and that was really helpful, very helpful. And I can't think of an, of an example, but really it was just in my own mind that this was going on. It wasn't a, a conversation or anything. It was just going through the day with calmer and more peaceful mind and recognizing when something happened that jarred it and seeing that and, and knowing that that had happened but not really trying to figure out why it happened or what just happened to make me go but just saying this is not me this is not mine taking a deep breath trying and just kind of trying to um move back to where I had been. And um the last few days that has gotten a little harder. The last few days have been a little bit more um more, you know, feeling like I was moving away from that and and having just existing with this anatta and trying to push it down, or this dukkha trying to push it down. But now that I came back, meditated here, I feel like I'm moving back in the right direction. So yeah. Thank you. It's worth yeah. the price of admission, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> the, uh, what you described too, uh, the the the. the, the the effectiveness of the treats that we retreats that we have and the way they're run, the immersion in the Dhamma, uh, that can be overemphasized. And yeah, that was your first retreat, wasn't yes. it? Yeah, and it's it's just remarkable um, <clears throat> how that develops. And that, and you were describing your mind united in your body, mm -hmm. and then you also it's good that you recognize when that starts slipping away. Uh, and what's the what's the antidote? More Dhamma. 
you know, or Dhamma <laughs> practice. So, thank you. Lisa, good to see you this morning. How have you been? Good. I actually understood everything I read. It was very I'm not sure about the point and all, but it was pretty clear. And what I thought was interesting was that these two uh, became disciples. These ideas. You know, Buddha wasn't the only one thinking of that. These yeah. I, I, ideas about something's not something's not right in our teachings. It doesn't mean anything to me. I what I need to know, but these ideas are just popping up, ran, you know, randomly. Yeah. Maybe all over the world, and it's yeah. interesting because sometimes inventions or different ideas. Well, um, histories that are different continents, mm -hmm. the same inventions or the same ideas um, are developing independent of each other. Um, yeah. Um, so that was interesting. But the, I keep thinking about you know, distilling what the Buddha said. There's 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 Dukkha, there's the there's the reality of it, there's the sensation of it, and and if you do that, it will all come back. You know, just like one line, and everything else is an elaboration of that. Mm -hmm. Um but those are the important things, those are the things that uh, Certain ones will be more meaningful than others. Like, oh yeah, I did that. And it's just that repetition, and all it just gets into my head. And then I, at least I know, I'm just more aware of comparing my behavior and seeing it in terms of of what I'm reading. Uh, like, I don't know, like being. You know, self righteous about something, uh, or um, you know, wrong speech, wrong actions, and, and I'm thinking of the more in terms of Buddhism, of Buddhism now, but it's not, it's like an automatic thing. So I know that's not right. So, uh, obviously, I'm not doing all you know, the, right, the right things, but it's uh, it's just become part of my being. Yeah. I don't know how to describe it. It's just all that repetition and all the talking and all the reading and it's just it's just, it's just getting in there. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So you're describing in beautiful detail right effort. And as we continue to engage in right effort, we begin to integrate the Dhamma. And there it is. It's it's within us now. And it's that that's exactly how it works. And now it becomes the framework for continuing to develop awakening. It's just that record. We all have talked about that in different ways, recognizing how the Dhamma is actually working in our life. Well, that's it. You know? Thank you. Eva, good to see you this morning. Um, it's really wonderful to be here with everyone. It's, um, I take refuge in the sun. Yeah. Thank you. Helen, good to see you. Thank you. Good to be here, be here with everyone. Helen radiates something that we can all benefit from. Um, I had so many thoughts from yes. so many things that everybody said today. I don't know if I can recollect them all um, because I was trying to be mindful with what people were saying while these other thoughts were coming up. <laughs> I would like to say this about that. So, um, you know, what David was talking about with the book uh, of disciples and the whole animal connection our contemporary book is uh, The Life of God. I don't know if mm -hmm. anyone has read that, but it's um, there's um, a boat that comes wrecked, and the, the, character, the main character in the story is now on the boat with a hyena, a lion, a tiger, and all of these animals that were on the boat. And 
goes through how he deals with all of the animals, and it's not until the end of the story, not how are your ears if you don't want to hear, <laughs> that it, the story it's unravels that each of those animals was a person on that boat, mm -hmm. and it's this projection of their their entity in an yeah. animal form. Yeah. Um, but that's a really interesting book. Um, it's a DVD of it too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they made a movie out of it. Um, also, Jen's story was written by the, is written as the Berenstein Bears story too. <laughs> 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 the brother and sister. I think she's on the top bunk and she hangs her feet down and they bump his head and it starts this whole all day long thing of them going back and forth and dip and bop and dip and then it escalates. <laughs> And the mom is always the calm Buddha in the book. And she's the one who asks them at the end of the day if they can remember what started it, and they can't. And so then there's no reason for it anymore. Right. Um, when we were growing up, one time Liz and I were going at it about something, and my dad said, and it was only yeah. once. Yeah. That's why I remember. <laughs> my dad said, you sound like fishmongers' daughters. And he took the two of us, we lived in a Victorian house, and we had big pocket sliding doors, and he took the two of us, pushed us into the other room, and closed the doors. <laughs> and there we were, standing and looking at each other, and we just started cracking up, because it wasn't important anymore, it wasn't what we thought it was, and it was just hysterical. Um, so we still all wrestle. <laughs> <laughs> that I want to say. I think he just discovered it a ninth factor of the eightfold. <laughs> right attitude. Right attitude. Yeah. yeah. And, and I talk like when my crew comes in the morning, you know, we, one of the things we talk about is bring on your PMA, your positive mental attitude. Mm -hmm. wow. And you know, if you don't feel 100% that day, but you can pull it off like you do, and the guy next to you feels like 100% that day, he's going to lift you up anyway. And so just all kind of. Kind of yeah, wow. <laughs> Thank you, Helen. Diane, good, good to see you this morning. God, this is a great speaker today. Yeah, <laughs> it's like it. It started out a great, great, gorgeous June day. But I didn't sleep all night last night, and not at all. I mean, I watched every minute tick by, and I don't know why, but I mean, there was a lot of dukkha going on in my head. The thing that was I kept doing and was see your thoughts. They're nothing. They they're nothing. And I, I was um, thinking about uh, um, no. Oh, it's not opinion. <laughs> Perception? No, no. Um, it's one of the, uh, anyway, 
and that led to non-self, no self. And I mean, with this progression, I'm like, oh my, I was thinking about it anyway. And I would think, no, no self. Oh, okay, that's okay. And I don't have to take any of this personal. It's just not their their thoughts, and I can pay attention to them or not. I have these choices, and I just kept doing that over and over again, and, and I kept saying, <laughs> the video is not dead. I kept saying to myself, I just wish I could get this over with once and for all and never have to deal with this mental stuff again, <laughs> and I could just, you know, poof, be, have it all, you know. But but the thing is, I, and then I said to myself, but you have, you have that. You know that you can say, Poof. You know that this thought is nothing. It's foam in the ocean. I love that foam in the ocean. I hated it when I first started. <laughs> <laughs> and now I begin to really like it a lot. And it's just, I mean, I, because that, I mean, all these thoughts I think, all these thoughts I think I had that I thought were so important and so devastating and so huge and so important in my life and and, and how they would impact, I mean, I'm a writer, and, and I, I was just organizing my office the last couple of weeks, and I'm thinking, I could just, I'm just going to trash all this paper. I get, need to get a shredder or something. But they, I mean, I'm glad I had the effort to, you know, I can see that now, that the thoughts are, um, on the ocean, and it's um, comforting in the middle of the night to know that that I don't that I have a choice. And I think I don't think all my life I realized that I had a choice to what to think. And that that's got to be the beginning of some kind of real freedom. And it's kind of nice. Uh, when you talk about uh, the quality of your mind or, or um, what's that thing you said? The fourth foundation of mind. No. Notice the quality of your mind. No, Be at no. peace with your mind. Be at peace with the yes. lesson. Yes. With the less than peaceful peace mind. I, could, I was saying that last night. Okay, this is what's going on and I'm not having that much control over it, but I can I'm, I'm doing what I'm doing. And Matt said to me one day, too, every day, 24 hours a day, you have to work at this. <laughs> you have to keep doing it. And and this ego mind really rebels a lot against that and says, I just, just, just I want to, I want to, I want to, or, or, you know, salvation or something like that. And I, I'm not going to get that. And that's, no. Okay. No salvation here. Just understanding. <laughs> Thank you. Jay, good to see you. How are you? Very good, thanks. I hope you're doing well. I am. Thank you. Okay. Uh, you said right first thing. You thought it was an auspicious day. I agree with you. The air is real nice and there's a nice feeling. Everyone's happy when you're walking around on a day like this, which makes a difference. You know, it's so how you, you, you spend your day. You know, when your knee is like, wow, they're in a great mood. Uh, continuing to meditate, uh, continuing to try and separate uh, my identity from my material possessions. That's kind of what I'm working on. I have way too many material possessions. And uh, I got to get to the point where, you know, that's not what's important and have done with it. I can vouch for Lisa. Uh, about three weeks ago, we were getting ready for a uh, delivery of a new rug. And as a last minute thing on Sunday, I think we're going to get Wednesday. I took the tape measure and remeasured the thing, and I turned out I had not measured it correctly. And I went all chicken brain. I got really <laughs> excited about it, and I'm walking around praying and raving to myself. And Lisa came in. I thought she would be excited and mad at me because I missed that I didn't measure the thing right. And you know, she basically said, "Look, you know, it's only a rug. You know, we can call up first thing in the morning tomorrow, and you know, have." Cut the thing or whatever, and don't worry about it. Okay, 
know, if you went all calm and Buddhist on me. That's a practical application. That's, a, that's what it's all about. <laughs> Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> Liz, good morning. Me too. Mary, good morning. How are you? Good morning. I'm having a lovely week. Mm -hmm. Every time I hear about celebrities, it's so soft. Yeah. You're saying the peace for less than peace for the biggest war. Yeah. Of course, it's upsetting and I need to stop punishing the property. Yeah. I. It, I thought about you, Mary, when I heard about those those two recent uh, recent ones, and um, it's one of those things when I you can't help but but try to go go to why. Yeah. But I, then I when I when I do that, I still I think of my my friend uh, brother Ken. I think I mentioned him. He he's a and I, I don't know the modern term, but he had now I don't remember seven or nine nervous breakdowns. They called them back then. And we used to have these great long philosophical talks. He was a, uh, a brother up at a monastery in Newton that's not there anymore. And we'd always come back to this. And, you know, and I'd ask these questions, why does God do this? And why did, you know, what happens? Why do babies all this? And he'd say, John, John, he says, don't ever ask why. If you want to lose your mind, keep asking that because we can't know. And none of us know. All we can get back to is what the, and that, that's kind of what set the Buddha off, isn't it? Why do all these things happen? And he, his conclusion was, as a consequence of having a human life, dukkha occurs. It's small solace, isn't it? But what it what it keeps us away from is that speculation, and hopefully, hopefully, it depersonalizes that. You know, we 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 can get ourselves out of it. But you know, again, those are all those are all words. You're in it, you know? and the best thing to do is to be at peace with a less than peaceful mind state and know that we work through it. But I was thinking of you this week, Mary. So I'm glad you came today. And sometimes. Responding is totally oh, it's entirely yeah. We're we're supposed to be saddened, and whatever else that we might feel, you know, if we have a connection to um, to the young woman Spader, to Anthony Bourdain, even you know, obviously we probably don't know them personally, but we might have a connection to them, and so we feel sad when we hear it. I mean, that it would be it would be anti-Buddha to to be joyous about it. Sadness is the appropriate feeling, but under, understanding that feeling within the context of the Dhamma, that sadness, of the, you know, regret could be called that, that this happened. It's just described. It's part of dukkha. It's not something we, we should escape, but we should be mindful of it. We should understand why it's occurring. So again, thank you for coming today and bringing that up. Kevin, good to see you this morning. Good to see you. Awesome, especially at least having one that's a thir <laughs> the Thursday night saga. <laughs> Didn't I tell you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the story. Now it just reminds us that awakening potential is just around the corner. We have the tools. Yeah. yeah, we do. Thank you. That's a, That's another thing about our our sangha. You know, we kind of feel what each other are feeling. We understand the arising and the passing away of that. It really is remarkable what takes place here. Um, Okay, that's it. I keep forgetting to ask. Does anybody have a group picture from our last retreat? Yes. Please send it. You don't have one? No. Please. Please. Yeah. Yeah. Need, need it for the for the record. You know, yeah. For the wall over there too. Uh, okay, that that's it. That was enough for today. We'll finish with uh, the Karaniya Meta Sutta. I think I I might have mentioned. That I was changing the Thursday night schedule, and it was only going to be the first Thursday of the month, and that would be a beginner's class. Um, 
and that, so that's changed in permanent. <laughs> and we'll, we'll continue to have Thursday night classes. Uh, the, I think the theme is going to be more of a brief teaching. There's a bunch of short suttas, one or two paragraphs um, that I think I'll, maybe I'll use Thursday night to teach those shorter suttas and maybe some. There's a set of uh, a set of the books called the Diga Nikaya, and a lot of that is by verse, and you can separate the verse the verse out by subject. And so, might be doing that on Thursday night. So, but we're going to continue. So, uh, <clears throat> let's uh, let's finish with the the Buddha's words on metta from the Karaniya Metta Sutta. So, find your relaxed meditation posture, <laughs> and again, gently close your eyes and gently close your mouths. And, Take a moment to become mindful of the sensation of breathing in your body. Breathing in and breathing out. Establishing mindfulness within the body. And this, these are the Buddha's words on metta from the Karaniya Metta Sutta. This is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech, humble and not conceited, contented and easily satisfied unburdened with duties and frugal in their ways, peaceful and calm and wise and skillful, not proud or demanding in nature. Let them not do the slightest thing that the wise would later reprove. Wishing in gladness and in safety, may all beings be at ease. Whatever living beings there may be, whether they are weak or strong, omitting none, the great or the mighty, medium, short or small, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born, may all beings be at ease. Let none deceive another or despise any being in any state. Let none through anger or ill will wish harm upon another. Even as a mother protects with her life, her child, her only child, so with a boundless heart should one cherish all living beings. <clears throat> Radiating kindness over the entire world, spreading upwards to the skies and downwards to the depths, outwards and unbounded, freed from hatred and ill will. Whether standing or walking, seated or lying down, free from drowsiness, one should sustain this recollection. This is said to be the sublime abiding. By not holding to fixed views, the pure-hearted one, having clarity of vision, being freed from all sense desires, is not born again into this world. Thank you all for a wonderful class this morning. Peace.